In terms of lab work, I think there's a lot of the, the guidelines will say to get a total testosterone in the early morning before 10 a.m., fasted or not, is sort of um, not mandatory to be fasted, maybe better fasted. But I think there's more to it than that. So can you delve into what does optimal diagnosis of test low testosterone look like? Yeah. The most important blood test is free testosterone, not total. And the reason is uh, testosterone circulates in the bloodstream in three forms. Um, and if you add them all up, that's what your total testosterone is. Or if you don't say the word total, if you, somebody gets a testosterone test, that's what they're getting. It's all the amount of testosterone they can find in a certain amount of blood. And so testosterone, uh, most of it is attached to other molecules as it circulates. And about two thirds is attached to this molecule called sex hormone binding globulin, which we usually abbreviate as SHBG. And the feature of that binding is that it is so tight. If the blood is going past the cell that needs testosterone, it, it, the testosterone won't come off that cell. It can't get into that cell. The second way it's bound is to albumin, which is the most plentiful protein in the body, uh, in the bloodstream. And, but it comes off relatively easily. We call that weakly bound. And then there's about one or 2% that's not attached to anything we call that free. The, cell, uh, the way the testosterone gets into a cell is only in its free form. Mm -hmm. These other things are these big bulky proteins. They can't, they can't get in through the, the cells have this lipid bilayer and uh, like a little film and, and testosterone likes that lipid thing. It just floats right through it. Yeah. No problem. So free is what works, but more importantly is that uh, we have this portion of total testosterone, about two thirds of it, which is not available to the cells. That's the part that's bound to SHBG. Mm -hmm. It turns out that there's a huge amount of variation from individual to individual about how much their SHBG is. And the more you have, the more your total will look good, but it's tied up and is not available to the cells. Yeah. So free testosterone, and some people in Europe, they often use bioavailable testosterone, which is the port part that's attached, which is free and attached to albumin, mm -hmm. but it excludes the SHBG part. But I've used free all my, all my career. And the problem then is that total testosterone can be misleading, which is why we doctors often see men who have all the symptoms in the world, but their total testosterone is above whatever number is they're considering normally. Doctors often say, well, I thought you had, I thought you had low T, but you don't. Your T's fine. Mm -hmm. Those guys actually are deficient in testosterone. If you measure their free testosterone, you'll find out that it's low. So do you measure it or do you calculate it? You know, most of the labs, if you order a free testosterone or if your doctor does, uh, it's going to come back as a calculated measure. It's sort of, in my opinion, it's kind of unimportant. There's been a debate, but I think it's a stupid debate about um, there's a way to measure it directly. Mm -hmm. And again, this is part of what I call the lore, L-O-R-E, the lore of testosterone. Some of these endocrinologists going back about 20, 25 years have determined that direct measurement of free testosterone is inaccurate and should never be used. Well, it's total BS. So we did a study. I don't even know. I'm, I'm going to mention this. The, it's, a, <laughs> it's a little technical, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much. I was using this test, which is a direct measurement of testosterone. Um, for 20 plus years, and it was great. And then one day I get a call from, it's a national lab that does it, it's Quest. I get a, a call from the national guy. He says, listen, you're the only lab and you're the only place in the country that continues ordering this test and we're gonna discontinue it. And I say, why? So I say, it's a really good test. Why are you discontinuing it? Because our lab director says, it's no good. I say, that's not true. And uh, it's not based on other evidence and other papers. And, in, and we had a conversation. I tell you what, let's take the next set of blood samples from you. And um, we'll do it, the test that you, we've been doing for you. And then we have this other way. There's a very, um, it's expensive and it's labor intensive way of measuring. It's called equilibrium dialysis. Instead of just running on a quick platform, it takes 45 minutes to get your mm -hmm. blood test results. 16 hours, it's labor intensive. Somebody has to actually do things, stir things, blah, blah, blah but that's considered the gold standard. So he has two, this is a national laboratory. They have two different places that do these two different tests. So they take 53 of our blood samples. They just split them. Mm -hmm. Half goes to equilibrium dialysis, the gold standard. Half goes to the test that's not supposed to be any good. Mm -hmm. He sends me back the results and they're perfect. The correlation is perfect. 
And when we submitted this for publication, some of the reviewers who are, it's almost like a religious cult around some of these things, said, <laughs> you shouldn't even be asking this question. They didn't even look at the data. What do you mean you they shouldn't wrote, be asking this it's, question? It's been determined that test is no good, but it's fine. So the short answer to, to your question is it doesn't matter how you measure it. The, almost everybody now, every lab will now do the calculated, which has the blessing of the different organizations. It's fine. But the other thing for your listeners to realize is that reference range is given by laboratories. So for every blood test that anybody ever gets, the lab gives you a range of upper and lower amounts. That's normal. Mm -hmm. But they're not clinically based. It means they're not based on whether somebody really has low levels of testosterone or not, and they vary from one lab to another. Yeah. So you could be normal with one lab and low with another lab. So most of the guidelines that are put out by different societies, I'm a urologist, we follow AUA guidelines. AUA says 300. It's a specific number for total testosterone. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the laboratory says, whether that's low or not. The endocrine society uses a different number. It's 264. In Europe, they use 350, basically, almost 350. And those are what those numbers are. But again, the problem is they're all related to total testosterone. Mm -hmm. And if you're a doctor and you're following that, you're going to be right about two-thirds of the time. That's not great. Two-thirds? Okay. Yeah. So if they're low, and here's where it works. If they're low and they have symptoms, you treat them and it's fine. Right. The problem is the guy who has symptoms and has a testosterone, total testosterone that's above that that value, mm -hmm. 300 or 350. And, uh, and the majority of those guys, if they really have, if you take a decent history, are going to be low on their free testosterone. And out of Europe, they've got this European male aging study that uh, the first author is uh, Antonio, mm -hmm. is the last name. And it looked at what happens. So they've got this nice study, European male aging study. They got a lot of data on these guys. They're relatively healthy. They have their testosterone levels, other hormones. But they looked at what happens when there's a conflict between the results of total testosterone and free. Mm -hmm. What if the free is low and the total's normal? What if the total is low and the free is normal? And it turned out that the symptoms always follow free. So if the low, if the total testosterone was low, but the free was normal, no symptoms. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't happen so much. The opposite is more common. Right. Total is normal, but free is low. Symptoms. Absolutely. Symptoms. So, so in terms of blood tests, you have to get a free testosterone, but you have to also ignore what the reference values are. Mm -hmm. So for free testosterone, the usual, what I use, uh, and I've written about this extensively, is that uh, levels of the calculated free testosterone that are less than 100 picograms per mil mm -hmm. are low. Yeah. There's other ways that it gets reported, like nanograms per deciliter. It's off by a factor of 10. So and 10, yeah. This is less than 10. Mm -hmm. Some of the labs will use values like 55, 65. I've seen them as low as 35. There's almost nobody in this world who has a testo free testosterone less than 35. That'd be like 3.5 nanograms per deciliter. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the problem then is that, that everybody's looking at these guys. And they say, well, I believe in free testosterone, but you're normal. But it's off. It's just, it's just, anyway, so that's the problem with reference ranges. So you need a total testosterone, you need a free testosterone. I like to order an SHBG because when there's a discrepancy and the SHBG is generous or high, I say, look, there's the answer. Right, right. Um, it's useful to get an LH test, which is luteinizing hormone. That's the hormone that comes from the pituitary gland that tells the testicles to make testosterone. Mm -hmm. If that value is very low and you repeat it and it's still low, then you have to worry that there's something wrong with the pituitary. It's not able to put out uh, what it needs to put, or the hypothalamus, which is the hormone secreting area above that. If the LH is high, it means the testicle is getting the signal that it should make testosterone, but it's not doing it. It's a testicle problem. Mm -hmm. So that's useful to see also, because you can say to the man, oh, I, I know why your testosterone is low. It's your testicles just aren't functioning well. They're not as sensitive to the signal anymore. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that can happen from injury or mumps, from uh, any kind of inflammation down there, epididymal or chitis, anything. It's a bad testicle, and they're usually very small. However, the most common scenario, and this confuses a lot of people, is that the LH is normal mm -hmm. and the testosterone is low. And a lot of people who aren't that familiar with this field, they go, oh, I don't know. The LH is normal, so maybe you're normal. No, 
the testosterone is low. Testosterone is the actual actor that we're looking at here. The other stuff is just clues yeah. as to what's causing. So that's what happens. And the reason you get a normal LH is, is that two things happen. One is, as we get older, our testicles, the factory for testosterone becomes, it's not as good, yeah. not as efficient. So for the same signal that says put stuff out, it makes less. Mm -hmm. And the other is that the sensing part of our brain about how much testosterone is around is also less sensitive. Yeah. If it was fully sensitive, it would send more LH down but it's not sensing properly. So it doesn't do it. And they end up in a, in a strange way, just with a normal LH level. Right. I see that very commonly. Yeah, yeah, all the time. What about estradiol? I think a lot of men have this misconception that you want that to be as low as possible. That's also an error. And there's a lot of uh, mistaken belief out there that estradiol is bad for men, that estradiol is like the women's hormone, testosterone is the men's. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know that men and women have not so dissimilar estradiol levels. We have mm -hmm. plenty of estradiol in men and women have a moderate amount of testosterone, less than men, but they, they still have a moderate amount. So you can't really call them male and female hormones. Not true. But this idea that estradiol and testosterone are in, uh, have their horns locked in battle <laughs> in the body, <laughs> it's just simply incorrect. And there's been some beautiful studies that show that some of the benefits of testosterone happen by its conversion to estradiol. So when testosterone circulates in the bloodstream, it goes different, different tissues. In some tissues, it has effects as testosterone itself. Spermatogenesis making sperm, for example, looks like it's a testosterone uh, pros mediated process. Other areas like um, um, uh, require DHT, dihydrotestosterone, which is converted from testosterone, and others need estradiol. It turns out that sex drive is largely mediated by estradiol, not testosterone. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that's out there, one of the trends I've seen is that a lot of people are being treated with a medicine called Clomid or Clomiphene. And I think they're being mistreated. Now I've used Clomid myself. Sometimes you want to, it preserves fertility. One of the side effects of testosterone is cause testicles to shrink a little bit, mainly because they're not producing sperm anymore mm -hmm. or producing much, much less. And so Clomid is a medicine that we've used in the treatment of male infertility. I've used it since I came out of my practice and came out of my training in, in the 1980s. It's off-label. It helps sperm numbers in maybe 30% of men, maybe. And the group in which it helps is those who have lower levels of testosterone. Mm -hmm. When I came out of my training, we gave it to every man with low sperm numbers, um, but it's not going to work in men who have decent testosterone. What Clomid will do is increase testosterone. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say, well, look, this guy's testosterone went from 300 to 500. That's pretty good. And if his, since his symptoms don't get better, they say, well, sir, I, I guess it wasn't testosterone that, that was your problem. Here's the problem. Over years and years of treating men with Clomid or Clomiphene citrate for infertility, I never once heard anybody say they felt amazing, mm -hmm. which is something we hear with testosterone all the time. Yeah. I never once heard it. Yes, their testosterone went up. We weren't necessarily seeing them for sexual problems or anything else. We were seeing them for infertility. But now that we're sort of more savvy about testosterone and its fertility issues, if you see a young guy who still wants to have a family, right? Or if he wants to have another pregnancy, he and his wife are trying to have a pregnancy, we have limited options because we can't give him testosterone. It's going to lower the sperm numbers. Yeah. So one of the treatments we can give them is Clomid. And so sometimes we do that. It's easy. It's a pill. You take it once a day or, or three times a week. And uh, how easy is that? looks like it's very safe. But we have the experience over and over again where people come back and either the wife has or the partner has become pregnant. Mm -hmm. So they don't, they, can, they don't need the sperm anymore or they've given up. And we switch them to testosterone because they didn't get a lot of benefit in terms of their symptoms. And we put them on whatever injections or gels and they say, oh my God, this is what I was hoping to feel all along. Yeah. Which they were, even though their testosterone levels are the same as they'd been on Clomid. Mm -hmm. So how do we solve that mystery? And the answer is, is that Clomid is an anti-estrogen. The reason it raises testosterone is because of the sensing area in the pituitary and the hypothalamus. It's making the body believe that there's not enough estrogen yeah. or testosterone, senses both. 
So it sends out more LH and more FSH, F follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. is important for the sperm part of this story, not important for testosterone part. So it puts out more of that. The testicles make more testosterone. But the effects of that higher testosterone are being blocked by the clomiphene citrate in the body. The estrogen ester dial is not going up. Or at least it's not being set. Estrogen dial goes up, but the effects of it are, are blocked. Correct. Because clomiphene citrate is an anti-estrogen. So the guys who are who are out there who are listening to your um, your show, who are on clomiphene citrate and feel like yes their testosterone went up but they're not noticing that much, if they're not trying to have a kid, they need to ask to be put on testosterone. Yeah, absolutely. If you enjoyed this clip of the Rena Malik MD podcast, make sure you check out the full episode with Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler right here.